Good evening. On behalf of KPCC and Southern California Public Radio, welcome to the Crawford Family Forum for tonight's program, The Changs Next Door to the Diaz's, a discussion about the link between identity and place, featuring author and scholar, Dr. Wendy Chang. And now, your host for this evening, KPCC Immigration and Emerging Communities reporter, Leslie Berestein Rojas. That was great. Okay, I'm Leslie. I cover immigration and emerging communities here at KPCC. And with me I have Wendy Cheng, who has already been introduced, but but I'm very glad that she's here. She did not travel all the way from Arizona to be here, but she would have, she says. She's in town. Um, Wendy is the author of The Changs Next Door to the Diaz, is also the People's Guide to Los Angeles, right? And she's an assistant professor in the School of Social Transformation at Arizona State, a writer and a photographer. So thank you for joining us, Wendy. Now, we're going to cue a video, right? Hang on. <laughs> we have a latecomer. I'm going to stay quiet until the video comes on. What? 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 Shema? What? Oh my gosh, stop right what? here. Oh, what? There's so many cameras. <laughs> what? What? All right, let's go. What? Garvey, Valley, Maine, what? Huntington, Garvey, Valley, Maine, Huntington. I'm gonna get noodles, only got $10 in my pocket. I, I'm on Garvey, yeah, I'm kinda starving. This is really awesome. Walk up on Garvey like, whoa, is this Chinatown? The new Chinatown, not the old Chinatown. Immigrant drivers, be careful when you ride around. Crooked in the lane, you can catch them swerving out of bounds. You can't find this mix anywhere on the planet. Toes the language a little via in Spanish, but almost everyone speaks Mandarin. Cause all the mainland Chinese are moving in. Don't they? if you like a good deal, then you gotta know this avenue. Go to JJ's and you don't even like the food. Mom and pop shops like holes in the wall. Grannies with grandkids, call them paw paws. From chiu chow noodles to the fun El Monte. You know the waitress, so remind you of your auntie. The streets packed, so you know it's a community. Hard working people just looking for opportunity. Posted up on Garfield, watching people. Ten dollars in my pocket. I, I'm on Valley. So many restaurants. This is really awesome. I'm gonna get some numbs. Only got ten dollars in my pocket. I, I'm on Valley. So many restaurants. This is really awesome. Uh, what you know about 300 Asian restaurants? So many different types. You never pick a best one. You could yelp for years, get help from peers, and you'll still miss a tasty spot. Tear Valley in O'Hara's full of banks from the farm. So many banks, you could call it Asian Wall Street, yeah I don't need a girl from the valley I just need a girl who knows her way around valley Two meals plus dessert, got you feeling like a fatty The most famous Asian food street out in Cali New after Del Mar, that's Little Mainland Drive by the Hilton and you better have patience Man, they say Asians are smart $80,000 cars and we don't know how to park I need something non-Asian I think I'm gonna hit multi-grain with major chains it's kind of nice for a change because this is america sometimes i need a burger and sometimes i want to speak english to my server alhambra's version of old town pasadena except not as clean and a little bit cheaper now it's last tunis is back to being asian but the asians speak english and there's more caucasians new developments last tunis getting busy and if you getting married downtown temple city yeah temple city nice people yep but let's keep heading north now we roll through Huntington, roll so wide, old money, new money, that's the divide. Asian stuff popping up, it's a matter of time, for the street ends up looking like San Marino High. For most people, it's just a street to the mall, but in a way, it's the most powerful street of them all. I'm going north of Huntington, where the rich people live, fancy streets so Every city has its own identity. These streets flow from east to west. I like every street in its own way. Valley, Maine, 
Huntington, Garvey, Valley, Maine. Huntington, Garvey, Valley, Maine. Huntington, Garvey, Valley, Maine. Huntington. I don't know how to follow that. <laughs> but I should ask, you know, who's from the San Gabriel Valley here? Okay, a lot of people. Um, okay, or people that are very familiar with it? Okay. So I'm going to ask you, you know, I mean, we just, we just saw, you know, the, the, you know, I'm sure you've seen the other one, you know, Eating Good in the 626. I love the Fung Brothers. Um, but what's your perception? Just to describe it in like 10 words or fewer. What's your perception of the San Gabriel Valley? What is it? Who lives there? Any volunteers? Okay. Uh, great weather, great hikes, beautiful place. Hey, I can't find a better place than this. <laughs> okay, so we'll turn to Wendy then, um, who explored really what we consider the core of the Western SGV, right? Alhambra, Monterey Park, Rosemead, San Gabriel. I'm going to ask, why did you choose those neighborhoods? And after exploring them, how would you describe, you know, if they're going to be a show, the real SGV? What's true? What's false? Well, I think those, is this on? I think. Okay. Yeah, right, okay. Um, I think those neighborhoods are the most well known when people typically think of the SGV and you can see that they're featured by the Fung brothers. And um, what was in that video is also what's typically known about the SGV if you don't actually live there, right? It's known as a suburban Chinatown, an ethnoburb, a place that's dominated by um, Asian immigrant culture and specifically ethnic Chinese culture. Um, but what I found really interesting when I actually moved to this area, so I had gone up to Monterey Park from, as a child from San Diego. My parents are from Taiwan, and we used to drive 100 miles every month or so just to get groceries at 99 Ranch. Right? <laughs> this was before the 99 Ranch um, spread into the rest of Southern California. Um, but I, like many other people, also had the impression that the SGV was an um, almost exclusively Asian immigrant space. And when I actually moved back there during graduate school, I found actually that um, there are quite a lot of Latinos who live there as well, and still some white people too. But really, um, most of those cities in that core area, Alhambra, Rosemead, Monterey Park, San, San Gabriel, are um, over 90% Asian American and Latino. And actually, this became the rationale for um, creating the State Assembly District 49, that relative balance between Asian American and Latino population. So I became really interested in how this place came to be and how people actually experienced their lives living there on a daily basis. Okay. So yeah. we're going to get into the kind of identity that's being forged there. But first of all, you have this priceless anecdote in your book. And it's about two young Mexican-American men who go look at a house for sale in Monterey Park. And there's this older Japanese American man there who greets them. And he, he lives nearby. He grew up in the neighborhood. And he talks to them. He starts complaining about excuse me, all these damn chinos moving into the neighborhood, right? Now, if you're from Latin America or you have any roots in Latin America, you know that chinos basically refers to the entire continent of Asia. Kind of the way in the US, like all Latinos are Mexican. It's, it's you know, does anybody know what I'm talking about here? Raise your hand. OK. So they were, of course, blown away and cracking up to see this man like talking about chinos. But um, it's a great anecdote, but it's also a very telling anecdote. It tells us a lot about the SGV, not just about the present San Gabriel Valley, but kind of how it got started. And there's a history there that you may not know. Um, Wendy, what can you tell us about the kind of redlining that took place early on in the SGV? You know, who was welcome, who wasn't, and how this kind of identity began to form? OK, that, that's a great question. Um, so this later phase that, that the SGV is the best known for, it didn't come out of nowhere, you know, that all of these um, ethnic Chinese immigrants d just pointed to a place on a map and decided to move there. Um, there's actually an earlier history after World War II of Mexican Americans and Asian Americans moving into the Western SGV. Um, and it was very convenient to East LA, Little Tokyo, and Chinatown. And it was one of the few places where they could kind of get an opening to actually buy homes. So after World War II was huge suburban expansion, a homeowner, mass homeownership available for the first time um, to people all across the US. But those homeownership opportunities, for the most part, were not available to people who are not white. 
Um, so what happened was that some of these new developments in Monterey Park actually allowed Mexican Americans and Asian Americans, um, and I'll talk about African Americans in a moment, um, to purchase homes. And so word spread very quickly, and um, people really fought for and established a foothold in those communities, and it really meant a lot to them because there were quite a few, most places they were not able to buy homes. So this man had grown up there. You know, what, what do you think was going on in that conversation? Well, I think this is, um, if we think about place, it's so important because there are very particular ways of thinking about race that grow out of the particular racial mixture in a certain area. So in that particular example, the adjacency of Monterey Park to East LA is really important because you have Japanese American and Mexican American populations that lived in the same neighborhoods for decades. And so they had developed a very similar culture where they really identified with one another. You know, so for example, Hector um, Bercera, a reporter at the LA Times, he's written about an East LA accent. <laughs> and the people who have this East LA accent are Mexican Americans and Asian Americans. So they're developing their own distinct culture that crosses racial lines, but it's very place-based. Right, right. Very familiar with that accent. Um, so fast forward to today then. Um, and I should actually you know, before we, before we get on, there was this line in there, you know, I'm gonna go north of Huntington where the rich people live, right? Is Huntington still this dividing line? I mean, what were the rules before concerning Huntington? Okay, so there's a long history there. Huntington, um, of course, gets its name from Henry Huntington, the railroad heir, and um, in the 19th century, Huntington, north of Huntington was really where all the um, huge land holdings, the vast um, estates were. And in the 19th century, you actually could not live north of Huntington if you were a person of color unless you were a servant, right? So um, that north-south divide in the SGV goes back a long time where you have laborers, working class, people of color living generally in the southern SGV and, and very wealthy um, landed elites who were um, pretty much exclusively white um, living north of that divide. Yeah, you can just really still see it today, driving down Huntington, it's really evident. So let me fast forward to today. Um, you, you, you write in the book about, of course, you know, this, this, this man, you know, Japanese American man talking to Mexican Americans about chinos, um, and you have the Chimexica flag, which is, you know, another SGV sort of badge of identity, it's kind of a flag, sort of, I, I forget how it's described on the site, but it's sort of, you know, from the SGV, a place where Chinese and Mexicans get along most of the time, you know, and, and so, um, so you have all these badges of SGV identity, um, but, but I want to ask you, just, just what is that identity that you describe as evolving? Is it a sense of otherness, and is it perhaps more about what we are not versus what we are? Mm -hmm. I think something that's really important that's happening in the SGV is that you have a majority non-white multiracial space um, that's being created that has a certain kind of stability that a lot of majority non-white spaces did not have in the past. Right, you have people that have a little more resources. A lot of them are homeowners. They're able to have a certain stability in their lives that traditionally um, people of color who lived more in poor um, urban core areas did not have. Um, so what's happening there is uh, there's a sense of cross-racial identification, a sense of openness to difference, prioritization and interest in certain shared values that people perceive, like um, understanding coming from an immigrant family, you know, and the kinds of obstacles that come with that, or um, living with an extended family in very flexible ways. Um, and I found that a lot of people that grew up in this context, they really um, saw those as positive things, and they weren't aspiring to something different than that, right? So they were kind of pulling apart the typical associations we have with suburban and middle class also being about assimilating into certain white norms or norms that have historically in the U.S. been coded as white norms. You know, you mentioned that we had an, a Q&A that we did online. It's up. You guys can read it afterwards if you want to get a little bit more, but um, mm. about that sort of aspiration because in traditionally for immigrants to become American is to, you know, basically aspire to whiteness or white norms of living, which used to be sort of the suburban sort of norm. So what's, what's changed there? I mean, if you kind of touched on that, but I'd love to hear more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I think a lot of the ways that suburbs developed in the U.S. had to do with racial and class exclusivity and sameness, right? People uh, taking care of their yards in the same way. Um, people um, only having a certain number of people in their household living in the house, right? And I think what um, happened in the SGV 
it's enabled by certain conditions. You know, one of it is that low, lower middle to middle class um, stratum that, that Asian, most Asian Americans and Latinos are living at. And um, there's a mix of um, owner occupied housing and rental housing, right? So people at different stages of their life or in different class positions can live in the same neighborhoods. And that's hugely important. Um, but what I found is that there's an attachment to the place that is not about um, trying to aspire to you know, the um, exclusive uh, fancy <laughs> neighborhood. So for example, there's uh, someone I interviewed, a young ethnic Chinese Vietnamese man, and he had grown up in a triplex with his extended family of 14. <laughs> And so they lived in that triplex and they rented it for years and years and years until they finally had enough money to purchase the exact same house, right? So to them, doing better didn't mean moving out into a different type of neighborhood. It meant staying in the same place. Okay, okay. And so we have all this diversity you know, in mm -hmm. the San Gabriel Valley, this we know, but, but diversity is a tricky word because it implies, you know, sometimes it's kind of like kumbaya, melting pot kind of thing. But we know better, and there are dividing lines, even in the most diverse of societies. So let's talk about just where these show up. You write about schools. You write about, like, say, in Alhambra Public Schools. The younger children, Latino and Asian American children, you know, you don't see any sort of real difference at that point. They play together. They're all buddies. But something happens when you get to the high schools. What happens then? Yeah, so the schools are a really huge factor in starting to pull people apart. Um, so in the neighborhoods, as Leslie mentioned, um, people did live pretty fluid lives in any, out of each other's houses, having really close friendships. But once they started getting into junior high and high school, they started to be um, not formally tracked anymore, but um, in practice kind of tracked into different types of classes um, that made their school lives very racially segregated. So then um, they stopped, um, they tended to stop having those same kinds of close friendships. Um, and a lot of the racial stereotypes and meanings that they encountered came to them from administrators, teachers, and staffs, you know, specifically um, treating Asian American students as model minority type of students that were expected to do well, and Latino students as not expected to do as well, right? So that started to have a huge effect on people's lives. So what are some examples of that? I mean, how, where, where were some of these kids tracked? What were they tracked differently into? Okay, so you, would start having a situation where the honors and AP classes were over 90% Asian, and then the um, so-called regular track classes would be uh, predominantly Latino. Um, and then similarly, extracurricular acti activities would be um, the sort of uh, high profile activities would be also dominated by Asian American students, whereas Latino students would be more into sports or other types of activities. And again, you, you talk about um, academic profiling. Um, you know, tell us a little bit about and how does that finally wind up? I mean, you know, what happens after high school? What, do, mm -hmm. what happens with these kids? Okay, so the term academic profiling, actually I just wanna credit Jilda Ochoa for that, who's written a really wonderful book exactly on this topic. Um, but it has huge consequences because what happens is students are being, um, let a lot of Latino students are being steered away from college. Um, and so this ha has huge effects on their life opportunities and opportunities of, of future generations. So do these kids, do they go on living in the San Gabriel Valley? Do they sort of just sort of split apart? You know, what used to be kind of like maybe these friendships early on, they just go on leading different lives, what happens? Um, I don't know, because I tended to talk with people at a certain point in their lives, and I, I didn't, wasn't necessarily able to follow them. So, um, of course, for individuals, there's quite a range. Okay. Um, so, you know, w we talk about this, and you, we have these dividing lines, but at the same time, life is going on, you know, boys are meeting girls, families are being formed, and you write in your book uh, this one example that kind of stood out. There was a young Asian-American woman whose mother really didn't want her dating Latinos, and then she met a guy who was very Americanized, he was second or third generation, and then her mother suddenly had no objection. Um, and so tell me a little bit about, about these scenarios that play out. You know, I mean, you, you have obviously blended families, but again, how does this diversity play out in, you know, things like social relationships, dating, you know, family dynamics? Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, in that, particular case, there were certain 
ideas of Americanness that that particular Asian mother had, right? So when she said, okay, you know, um, the Lopez's, well, they eat meatloaf, right? <laughs> They're more American, so that's okay, right? Um, so I think what a lot of people um, expressed to me was that there might be objections initially, but because they were based on um, stereotypes or ideas that didn't come from actual experience, those tended to fall through pretty quickly. Um, I think the SGV, it's not necessarily that there's so much, so many more multiracial individuals or multiracial families than other places, although there may be. <laughs> um, but I think what happens is that because, especially because of this realm of friendships, um, that people start to identify across racial lines in ways they wouldn't otherwise and to feel a familial connection to other people that they might not otherwise, you know, so for example, this extends to people that we might not expect. Um, I remember a story of an older white woman who was part of the sort of like old guard political elite in San Gabriel, and um, she had an experience where um, at one of the meetings um, in which there were no Asian Americans present, people were speaking about Asian Americans in a very negative way, and afterwards she came up to um, a, uh, Mexican-American guy, and she told him, um, he was the one who told me the story, um, she told him, you know, I don't understand why they have to talk about Asians that way, and um, the reason why she said that was because her daughter-in-law was Taiwanese, and she had a granddaughter who was half Taiwanese. So by that, it, so that kind of mixing has a ripple effect, right, that then changes who it's possible for people to identify with, and it really starts to blur the lines between who we consider part of us and who we consider part of them, which are so important to the idea of stable and separate racial categories. Are there still some groups, I mean, just talking about the part of the San Gabriel Valley that you explored that maybe still aren't accepted? You talk about a, a Boy Scouts incident. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so part of the, um, the really important structural context that we think about for creating the, this majority Asian American and Latino SGV that we know today was that African Americans did not have the same level of opportunity to move into some of these areas that Asian Americans and Mexican Americans had. Um, so a lot of the developers that were letting some Asian Americans and Mexican Americans move into these new homes and purchase these new homes were not allowing any African Americans at all. Um, so you have a place that, you know, it's not, it's not paradise, right? There's this kind of move away from an aspiration to whiteness, but at the same time, that's still built on um, a, a kind of anti-black racism that undergirds American society. So, so what happened in Troop 252? <laughs> yeah, so um, there's a whole chapter in the book that's about um, a kid that became the first African-American Eagle Scout in a Boy Scout troop in the area that was majority Asian-American and Latino. And um, he and his um, mother really embraced this as a historic moment, and a lot of um, political leaders, local political leaders did as well. Um, but the troop, the leadership of which was all Asian American and Mexican American, a lot of them were very uncomfortable with this um, focus on race. And so it became an opportunity to um, explore how blackness in the SGV is still this thing that doesn't quite fit or people don't really know what to do with it. Um, so. So what do you do? I mean, what happened? Actually, what happened to this little boy? What happened? Did he stay in the? Did his mom pull him out? What happened? Well, he became an Eagle Scout. So by, by that time, he was 18, um, and and I think it provided it forced everybody involved to look really deeply at their own feelings about race, um, both in their personal lives and where they thought um, we were as a society. Um, but what was really interesting is that even in this space where you know, it's something like 2% of the, of the population is African American, really low, um, you could see that they would speak uh, really fluidly about um, black racial stereotypes, you know, that they could kind of reel them off and say, well, it's not possible that he was discriminated against in the troop because you know, he's not a typical African-American African kid, right? He, <laughs> um, 
So, but, but then at the same time, there were um, people in the troop that also did feel that he was somewhat given a harder time, had a harder time coming through because he was African American and that he was treated differently. Um, so, so even though there are certain racial dynamics that, were, that are happening in the SGB that um, challenge kind of national racial hierarchies and the, think, the ways that we think about race more broadly, um, they also can't escape them, you know, so they would speak differently about, you know, for example, the troop leadership would say that some of the Chinese American kids um, had, uh, how did they put it, absent fathers, but the way they talked about the African American kid, they said that he came from a broken home. Right, so that so that they couldn't escape these kinds of larger discourses, even though um, they had experienced discrimination in their own lives and in other ways, they were they had sort of solidly anti-racist principles. So there still is that degree of exclusivity, of again, you know, who who were not. Yeah, I, th I think so, but I don't think it's as solid in the SGV as it may be in other places. You know, so um, there was also a case in the 1960s um, when people were really fighting for housing justice where an African-American um, couple wanted to purchase a home in a development in Monterey Park, and the developer refused to sell the house to them, but the Monterey Park City Council and the neighbors in that neighborhood actually supported them, and they were able to purchase the house. You know, and that's so, and that's a really different story from what happened in most suburbs in the U.S. So, what are other aspects of life in which which race plays a part, or doesn't? I should say, in the San Gabriel Valley, that sort of sets it apart. Well, I think um, you know I'm not the first to find this, but one of the things that becomes really clear is that. Um, People who grow up in, uh, people of color who grow up in a majority, um, people of color environment, a lot of times they are able to just feel much more comfortable in who they are, you know? So um, you see this shift happening now where kids will just say, I'm Chinese or I'm Mexican, whereas previous generations might have felt that they needed to qualify that with Chinese American or Mexican American. Right, there's something happening there where there's a real comfort in, in who they are. Um. You, you wrote about, and I, it's, it's been a while, and I don't know if this case took place in the present or in the past, but somebody who was Japanese American who was growing up in the San Gabriel Valley who then went to Orange County and, and talked about getting that look. What, what happened there? What was, what was, what was that about? What, there was a sense of comfort that was there in the valley that wasn't elsewhere. So I think this is particularly true for Asian Americans um, who grow up in the SGV. Um, they develop a certain sense of comfort that then gets really challenged when they leave. You know, so I interviewed one woman who went to college um, at UCSB, and she said that when she got there, she felt like an alien. <laughs> Right, and you even have um, kids who go to UCLA and feel that way. And UCLA is, you know, f what forty percent Asian now. <laughs> You know, so I think especially for a lot of Asian Americans who grew up in the SGV, it, wa it was a little difficult for s some of them to go to a place um, with a different kind of racial makeup. Is there any place like this in the country? Any other? I've, I've, I've heard comparisons to Brooklyn, I guess the Brooklyn of old, but, but I mean, any other places like this in the country? Um, I think it's pretty unique in that the, so, so the suburban Chinatown uh, name is actually true <laughs> and important because um, there were certain conditions that made uh, ethnic Chinese immigrants able to change the landscape of the SGV um, after the 1960s that um, were not that are starting to happen in other places but haven't happened on such a large scale um, anywhere else. So in that regard, I think it's still fairly unique, but in terms of the kind of multiracial everyday life and those long histories, if you think about, you know, um, the SGV having always been a multiracial space, you had Asian American and Mexican immigrant labor always present there, um, and then before that, the, um, the Tongva Gabrielin, you know, indigenous people. Um, so if you start to dig under any kind of surface, you can find those really complex, layered, and multiracial histories. And we talked about the ethnoburb. Actually, you know, that was a term that was coined, you know, out of the SGV, right, by 
Wei Li. Wei Li, yeah, um, a while ago, a good 15 years ago. Um, but but I guess you know that that it, in itself is a concept because we think of it as some sort of like one massive block. So I guess you know what your research really does is you know whoever's thinking of a ethnoburb as a massive block, it's really not. It's actually a composition of many people. Right. Yeah, and I think this really speaks to um, how race is typically imagined in the U.S. as these separate trajectories where people um, have these histories that are kind of adjacent to each other but not mixing. But actually, that's not true. Um, mo you know, there are so many spaces that have these incredibly interesting multiracial histories, but because um, we're kind of trained to see um, racial tra trajectories as happening um, in these exclusive ways, um, a lot of not enough attention has been given to that. So then, you know, finally, I mean, just, just to conclude, you know, why was it important for you to put this little slice, this little piece of Southern California on the map. Um, what does it bode? What does the status quo in the San Gabriel Valley bode for the rest of Los Angeles, California? Our demographics continue to evolve. Um, you know, is the 626, you know, the way that the nation goes next? Uh, well, I think it definitely is an important moment to look at these kinds of dynamics because, um, because it is a moment in California in which um, white people, non-Hispanic whites, are no longer the majority, and every trend shows that the rest of the nation is going in that direction as well. So um, there are going to be more places like the SGV in that sense. Okay, all right. And actually, we're kind of concluding a little bit early, but, um, but I'll ask you to elaborate a little bit more. I mean, just sort of, you know, what, we just had this big shift right here. Are there other parts of Southern California where you're actually kind of seeing this mixing? Because I do see you know, areas like Cerritos, you know, again, having this sort of evolution. Do you see this, the spread of the 626 phenomenon around Southern California as we continue to change our demographics? Absolutely, and I think especially because the um, Latino population is continuing to grow, the Asian population is continuing to grow, so you are seeing that particular mix happen in more and more places, and I think there's just so much potential for people to really look into that, and I think the um, most exciting and fun expressions of what can come out of that are, you know, we're, that we're going to start seeing them. Okay, all right. Is it okay if we open up to questions a little bit early? Okay, all right, ask away. Got one right there in front. Oh, okay. My name is Blaine Johnson. Um, been involved with a uh, law firm off and on f since uh, mid '80s. That started in uh, Monterey Park. Now is uh, centered, <coughs> excuse me, on uh, Valley and San Gabriel Boulevard, right in the heart. And um, one of the things, Chinese um, clientele is about 95%, and um, just the observation of, of the things that you're reciting. The one thing, I understand San Marino High School is about 85% Asian now, so that's certainly moving north of Huntington. Uh, one question on the demographics, it seems like now mainland, <coughs> excuse me, mainland Chinese are the coming in with a lot more wealth than the previous generation of immigrants. So I wonder if you could comment a little bit on that. Is there a specific question? <laughs> well, the question would be uh, the, the trend lines. We say Chinese, for example, but you've got Taiwanese previous to that, people that had immigrated from Chinatown itself out into Monterey Park area. So you've got, in effect, a third generation or a third sub-demographic moving through uh, into the SVG. Um, and I'm just wondering how, how much you were able to perceive of that while you're doing your research. Mm, okay. Um, well, I think something really important happened in that second wave, um, which a lot of which came from Taiwan and Hong Kong, and they did bring a lot of capital resources education with them in a way that previous generations had not, and, um, and, that, and they, they were then able to build um, opportunities for business loans and um, in a way that, and home ownership loans that they weren't before. Um, the mainland Chinese, I think that's probably coming uh, both at the low end and the high end, right? Uh, um, people who are working in the restaurants and the foot massage 
um, parlors and, and things like that, and then also the um, people who are, have more wealth. But I, I, I actually don't know um, where, that's, where that's going myself personally, but it would be a great topic for someone to look into. I'll ask, can I ask a question just based on that? Um, there are always, you know, interesting dynamics and tensions between different generations of immigrants, but how is that playing out with some of the old-time families that initially settled in Monterey Park and other areas as the new wave of immigrants come in, especially immigrants that have more wealth? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of, so there was this established Asian American and Latino, uh, mostly Mexican American population that was here along with the um, white Americans when um, the ethnic Chinese immigrants really started to come in in large numbers. And a lot of them had similar feelings. You know, they felt like the place was changing too fast. They wanted it to stay the same. But I think the key difference is that if you look at a graph of what happened during those, uh, those years from the 70s to the 90s, you see the white population really plummeting, um, with the exception of some people I know who are in the audience. <laughs> Um, you see the white population really plummeting, and then you see those um, the Asian American. You know, you can't really separate out the Chinese American, but you can separate out the Japanese American, and you see the Japanese American numbers staying roughly the same, and the Mexican American numbers staying roughly the same. So, um, what I found in my interviews is that people, even though some of them were um, upset by the changes that were happening, they didn't feel that it was a reason to leave. Right, so they reacted quite differently than a lot of whites in the area did. All right, thanks. Okay, more questions, yes. Hi, my name is Victoria, and I grew up further east in the San Gabriel Valley, and was wondering if you'll do a part two looking further east, because where I grew up, there was a lot of Filipinos, and there's actually, my, where my mom's house is, a Sikh temple, uh, the San Gabriel Muslim Center, mm-hmm. um, and so I'd be interested to kind of hear those dynamics. Uh, my high school prom date was actually Egyptian, and we were all multicultural. And I know people talk about Boyle Heights as being very multicultural. And I always think that, like, well, my little pocket of the San Gabriel Valley was quite multicultural. Mm-hmm. And then just to give one anecdote um, to kind of illustrate the whole broader point of this conversation, in my high school, we are not too far from the Buddhist temple. And they saw our band and drill team and color guard perform. And they sent us to Taiwan uh, for some new leader, it was like high school, high schools all over the world, and so you have this little band of high school kids from the San Gabriel Valley in Taiwan, and the mixture was Mexican, African American, as well as Asian and Filipinos, and um, so it was, I'm just so excited to have this conversation. Great, thank you. Um, what's the name of the city you're from? Well, it's uh, officially, well, it's an unincorporated county, but it's La Puente, which borders right next to Roland Heights, Walnut, City of Industry, um, I'm at Nogales High School is where I went to. Okay, great. Yeah, um, well, just a quick side note that you made me think of, which is that the unincorporated areas were also really important for uh, people of color being able to move out and build their own homes. Just a little side note. Um, But yeah, I think that that's another thing that the Fung Brothers video raises, is that there's a way that um, Chinese is standing in for all of the Asians, too. (laughs) That's not always addressed. Um, So uh, personally, I don't think I will be doing that project um, soon, but I hope that somebody does. And I know, actually, that there are some scholars that are are working on the Eastern SGV, um, and hopefully their work will be out soon. Yeah, you're near Diamond Bar, too, right? Yeah, when you're from the Northeast area, you know, we always looked up to Diamond Bar because that's where every that's where you arrived, and then I saw other parts of the city. <laughs> it's like there's yeah, but that's yeah. But Diamond Bar is just like you know now this very multicultural place to arrive, even though it's still you know affluent. But I mean, yeah. everyone's moving there, you know. So that's a really interesting part of the valley. I agree. Um, more yes. Hi, I'm Daniel Tomasic, and uh, I live in Whittier, but I've also spent time in uh, uh, Chapman Woods, which is just uh, like five years there, which is right above uh, Huntington. And there's a lot of like private houses, big property. Everybody has their uh, walls real high. It's really white predominant. There was one Latino family living next to us, but they're very different from us. Uh, we didn't socialize at all. And uh, I just, I, I was, it was something you caught me when you said there was like 2% uh, of the black ethnicity that's uh, there. So I had wondered, uh, I live in Whittier, I don't really see a black population there either. And as you get farther towards Orange County, it, it, it just seems um, 
less unless you go more towards Southgate. So is I had to wonder is, one is uh, from what you see in a trend, is there a reason for the black culture to move to San Gabriel? Are they trying to go there? And if they do, it, does it help spread the culture that they everybody's trying to go towards a general direction like Orange County? Or is there like a, like a goal that everybody wants to meet? You know, everybody wants to get to, I don't know, San Diego, where that's. It's <laughs> <laughs> an interesting question. Does everybody want to go to Orange County? <laughs> um, <laughs> There was a time. But, yeah. yeah. Well, I think you know African Americans um, over th in the late 20th century they really experienced hyper segregation in Los Angeles from um, Central LA down into that South LA corridor. Um, so it doesn't make immediate sense for um, them to have wanted to move to some place like San Gabriel um, because that was um, apart from the main African-American population center. But at the same time, you also have really established African-American communities in Pasadena, East Pasadena, Altadena. You know, so so um, there are places for that sort of history in the SGV, but it doesn't have the same kind of adjacency to um, certain historical cores um, like it did for Asian-American and Latino populations. Hi, my name is Jeannie. I'm, I'm going to ask about recent events in Santa Ana, the, the nightclub, the tragic uh, death of um, um, Kim Pham, and, and, and now the second woman has been arraigned. And I, I, I know this is not quite on topic, but wondered if you saw um, something more insidious happening in a, in a city like Santa Ana, which has you know, problems with its representation, you know, form of government, um, or what, what is happening South Orange County versus the SGV? Um, actually, I'd love to hear you say a little more about um, what you mean by something insidious. Well, it, it just seems there the, the political tensions are bubbling, and, and we saw in Santa Ana and Anaheim, um, you know, explosions of rage, you know, in the past couple of years. So, so there we've got political fomenting unrest and 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 you know um, local government and SGV seems to be a very different school uh, maybe more um, development oriented and uh, well so I, I mean I, I, I don't have any other opinions so I'm just wondering what you thought mm, yeah um, yeah I, I think part of what you're talking about too is just a different a different sense of empowerment. I think people do feel very underrepresented in in Santa Ana, and that contributes to what you're talking about. So, yeah, what what is different, I guess? Mm -hmm. in yeah, the yeah. Unfortunately, I don't know too much about Santa Ana, but um, again, you know, I think there are so many rich uh, topics for people to look into, and definitely that part of Orange County is another Asian American and Latino dominant space um, that has very different historical conditions than the SGV. So, um, I think that would be uh, a great place to look into further. Okay, all right. Anyone else? Yes, please. Oh. Uh, my name's Jennifer, thank you very much. Uh, I spend a lot of time in the San Gabriel Valley. I consume a lot and I eat a lot here. What role do you think the foodie culture is actually having um, in kind of in breaking down some of the barriers, um, race, racial barriers? And can the region do a better job of even attracting uh, other tourists from outside of the San Gabriel Valley to this region because we have such rich culture and really rich eating opportunities. <laughs> well, I think the food in the SGV is justifiably famous. <laughs> um, in terms of, yeah, I mean, you know, you see the Latino families eating at Noodle World along with the Asians at all hours of the night. <laughs> um, but I, I think that, one thing that has made the food so good, um, I don't remember who said it, some famous food critic, um, but that it's uh, Asians cooking for themselves, right? Cooking for their own communities. Um, and I don't know that, you know, I kind of feel like Jonathan Gold writes down the restaurants that then people from outside of the SGV um, who are not Asian feel comfortable going to, <laughs> and then they don't really, check out the other places. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, that might be a good thing for the city councils to look into, but um, it definitely wouldn't have 
developed in that way if they had started in that way. Yeah, I remember one time going to a meeting at Lucy's El Adobe I mean, when, on Melrose, and um, it's horrible, but um, I'm sorry. <laughs> It is horrible, but I remember like there was this really like like really like unspicy like horrible salsa that somebody gave me, and I was like, "Do you have any like I don't know tapatio sauce like anything?" And they're like, "No, no, our clientele's white. Nobody really cares." So I was like, "Oh, you know." I mean, and that was that was like 15 years ago. I think people actually really do care quite a bit, but um, but yeah, I think I think the people you know the cooking for themselves thing is a big deal, and it may not have started out. It may, it may not have been that if it started out differently. So yeah, it's not PF Chang's. Um, I'm, I'm cutting down everybody. Oh my God, it's terrible. But um, <laughs> I like food, good food. Okay, go ahead, please. Hi, my name is Joanna. Um, my question was, I'm just curious in the conversations that you had and the interviews that you had among the young people that are growing up in these diverse communities, what is the conversation like about in regards to race? Because um, I find that in some communities, for example, in Alhambra, they now have um, Alhambra Source, which was um, a great online uh, news place where people can kind of converse about those issues. So I'm just wondering if you had any conversations with young people about that. Yeah, um, the largest concentration of young people I talked to were around the um, issue at Alhambra High, which, which um, Jari Chung, who's in the audience here, where are you, Jari? Can't see anything else. Hi. <laughs> Wrote about in the LA Times, um, and that was really about a big um, controversy that that came out of talking about the achievement gap uh, between Asian American and Latino students at Alhambra High. Um, so I think um, those particular students um, were really struggling to make sense of why things were happening the way that they were. Um, but I think something like Alhambra Source, which is an online um, community-based news source that publishes in English, Spanish, and Chinese, something like that, and they really encourage youth from the community to contribute. I think something like that is really important because it makes people feel like they all um, have a place in uh, the identity of that particular location and that they can contribute to it and what they're saying is important. Um, so I think the point of sort of most uh, cross-racial fluidity interaction, um, most kind of explicit anti-racist identification that I found was in the generation that grew up in the 80s and the 90s in the SGB when there was the most parity between the Asian American and Latino populations, um, both in terms of class and in terms of actual numbers. Um, so I do think that's starting to change a little bit now as the um, Asian population continues to rise and the Latino population stays the same or slightly declines. So there is something to be said for um, the conditions that made these two groups roughly um, you know, equal in terms of their presence during a certain time. Any other? Hello, my name's Kurt, and uh, uh, I've remodeled a few homes in the last 20 years around town here in Pasadena, and uh, so I spend a lot of time in Home Depots. I'd love to take you with me and have you watch what's happening quite often. And uh, I'll be in the Alhambra Home Depot over the last 20 years, and I will watch mostly uh, Latino uh, staff in the Home Depot serving uh, immigrant Chinese uh, in, in there, and it's, you know, it's blue collar with working class. And, and there seems to be a sense of anger and frustration that I would guess comes from displacement. And I don't seem to witness that in uh, the different social classes. Like if, what I, I've spent a lot of time in the local high schools and I don't know that I've ever seen that kind of those displacement issues in like a Gabrielino or, or some of the other high schools that might have a different social class in them. I was wondering if you could speak to that. Yeah. Are the people you're talking about, do they actually live in the area? I think so, you know, because uh, you, you start to see a pattern where you see the same people if you're doing a lot of work, that they seem to all have the same day off as me. Uh, so, you know, it's, you start to recognize people, you know, after a few years in the same Home Depot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, without knowing the specifics, I don't know if I could say. Um, I didn't find that too much in my interviews, um, and, I, and I think it is because of the relative class parity that at least the people I interviewed had, you know, and, and you do see that 
play out in the numbers that, um, in, at least in these particular four cities that I focused on, um, that Asian American and Latinos have um, almost exactly the same per capita income, um, and that's much less than whites. Um, so, you know, I think people sometimes express frustration at not being able to um, communicate in restaurants or supermarkets, um, but there may have been things that they didn't say to me either. Yeah, and class parity kind of taking us back to, to Orange County, there are different dynamics there as well than what you're discussing in the San Gabriel Valley, which is, you know, creating some of these tensions that, that we're seeing even surrounding this particular case. Um, anybody else? There you go. Hi, my name is Marla. I live in San Gabriel. Um, one, of, one of my questions was, um, in your research, um, when you're looking at place, um, and you spoke a little bit about development, um, have you studied um, the, the, the development that has occurred on Valley Boulevard, for example, in San Gabriel, and how it has changed the face of that community? Um, more, more Asian businesses, more I Asian style of architecture, um, and, you know, what's the reaction, or if you've gotten any reaction in that community? Yeah. Well, San Gabriel and the sort of civic landscapes of San, San Gabriel, those, um, those are huge. <laughs> Um, objects of struggle <laughs> over the past 20 years. And there, um, I do have a chapter in my book where I talk about uh, the dynamics in San Gabriel between Valley Boulevard and, say, the Mission District. Right? So right now, um, in San Gabriel, there's a struggle over the identity of the city, I think, and who's going to be represented in that identity. Um, and it's, it's very striking because, so um, there's also a huge, um, race and class divide between North San Gabriel and the southern part of San Gabriel, as I'm sure you know. So um, in northern San Gabriel, in the northern zip code, um, there are three and a half times more um, white, non-Hispanic whites um, in the north, and the per capita income is also two and a half times as much as it is in the south, which is much more Asian. Um, and there's been a real struggle over Valley Boulevard, um, that section of San Gabriel, it's a tremendous generator of revenue for the city of San Gabriel. It's incredibly dense, has tons of restaurants, banks, and businesses. Um, but it's b really been a struggle for business owners there to, um, to assert that they are part of San Gabriel's identity. You know? And um, this is something that even though the demographics of the area reflect you know, an Asian majority, that has definitely not been the case in city politics. You know? So in San Gabriel, um, up until 2003, they never had an Asian American city council member, and they have five city council members at a time. And um, the population of San Gabriel is 60% Asian. You know, so there are often struggles in the city council of um, saying that Asian businesses don't serve the public. You know, and I spoke to one um, city council member who at the time was the only Asian American city council member, and he was so frustrated because he said, you know, we're 60% of San Gabriel's population. How are we not, how are these business, businesses not serving the public? You know, so there is still that struggle where um, Asians are considered to be apart from and different and not a legitimate part of the identity of these places. Um, is, is, I'll just cut in, is, is San Gabriel, you know, the only place where this is happening? Other, other parts, maybe you didn't study the whole valley, but, you know, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because I find a couple of different things interesting. There's that struggle, and then there's the intergenerational struggle. Like in Monterey Park last year, I don't know if you remember, there was a measure to try to um, have everyone to have some sort of, they called it Roman alphabet but like English language lettering on the signs. And it was again coming from you know, city, um, city leaders who were second generation primarily, or just were English speakers at least. Um, and you know, I'd spoken to some who were first generation who just didn't really you know, care if it was, if it was gonna be you know, English or not. But what can you tell us about that? Yeah, um, well I think you know, th these things have played out very strongly as struggles over space. You, know, you still have um, Asian American city council members that go north of Maine or north of Huntington and have people tell them to their face that they're Chinese invaders, right? <laughs> this is a real story that somebody told me, um, whose name I do not mention. <laughs> um, but yeah, the um, English only uh, and slow growth ordinances um, were a huge struggle in the 1980s in Monterey Park. Um, and a lot of that uh, was 
somewhat coded racially, but really blatant in the way that it played out, right? Because it was mostly targeting Asian business owners. Um, the recent thing I find interesting, because it's actually not English only, <laughs> right? It, they're asking for Roman letters. And so if, if I think about English, then, you know, if it's English only, then we shouldn't have um, trattorias or bistros or cafes, right? <laughs> Um, but so I, so I actually feel personally that the Roman letters is a slightly different issue and that people were kind of knee-jerk reacting um, perhaps because of trauma from those earlier struggles. Perhaps, perhaps. But yeah, it was something that could be read by people who just basically like could read Roman alphabet, you know, whether it was like, you know, a, a word that was otherwise like not familiar to them. But I thought that was really interesting. Um, anybody else? Go ahead. Yeah, hi, my name is Sam. I, I live in uh, Pasadena. Uh, since the topic is about Asian uh, Americans, a lot of talk about Asian Americans, did you come across any Indians as well in your interviews, or uh, uh, was that sort of missed out? I'm sorry, can you repeat the last part of the question? Uh, no, my question, my question was, you know, when you were interviewing people and when you were looking at it, uh, since the topic is about you know, it seems to be a lot about Asians. Well, did that also cover the Indian community, or uh, uh, did you get to come to meet yeah. people from India, and did you talk to them as well? Because I haven't, I didn't hear much about that, that's why. Right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's a really important point, you know, that um, in this area, people tend to use um, Asian uh, when they're, they actually mean uh, mostly ethnic Chinese. <laughs> Right, yeah, so, so in my uh, interviews and in the people that I talked to, I did not actually um, encounter any South Asians. Anybody else? Yes, <laughs> Elaine. So in your observations, um, you've talked a lot about the everyday. So as far as everyday spaces, um, in which everyday spaces have you seen the most contested? You know, where have you seen the most you know, harmony or accord? And really on that everyday level. Yeah, so, so I think, um, as I mentioned briefly before, neighborhoods were the places where the most kind of fluidity in terms of people um, making close relationships and crossing those boundaries were. And I think that really speaks to how important it is to try to have neighborhoods that are heterogeneous in terms of class, in terms of race, in terms of types of families um, and experiences. Um, because in schools, um, Schools and city council um, and these more sort of official civic institutions, those racial lines were um, much more cl clearly drawn and people had to contend with a lot of racial stereotypes that we deal with um, as a country, right? That weren't necessarily coming out of their own experiences um, when they went home at night or when they were walking around in their own neighborhoods. Anybody else? Okay, go ahead. I'm gonna actually have some photos here. Did I'm I... Sylvia Holmes, and my question is, did you see any place change, and when it changed, it became more conducive to people talking to each other that might not have otherwise talked to each other, or maybe even worse, just because of the physical locations change? Yeah, I, I think so, and this was why I was so interested in looking really closely at particular events, you know, so the um, controversy over the achievement gap at Alhambra High. It was a huge struggle in the community and a lot of um, feelings um, and issues came out that had previously been repressed or taken for granted. And they went through a really difficult process between the administration, the teachers, the student, the community, in trying to figure out how to move forward from that. You know, so the, a young Chinese American um, student, a senior, had written a column speculating about why the achievement gap um, existed between Asian American students and Latino students in terms of test scores. Um, and he speculated that it was due to cultural reasons, right? And of course, many people were, were um, hugely upset by that. But what it did was that, what it achieved was that it opened up a dialogue for people to talk about things that had already been troubled, troubling them, but they didn't have a 
platform to express it. And so what actually came out of that was a few years later, um, the school had had a much more um, labor-intensive uh, process for being able to go into honors and AP classes for students. They had to apply and they had to have um, a teacher write or staff write something for them. Um, and so what they did was that they instituted open enrollment in those classes so that any student that wanted to take those classes um, could, could take them. You know, so um, it's, I don't know what kind of effect that has had since, but um, these kinds of conflicts do often provide an opening for those relationships to be examined and then shifted. Okay, over there. Sorry, I have another question. Oh, okay. uh, have issues of sexuality come out? Uh, when I was in high school, I have high school friends who, who were gay but felt like they had to leave the San Gabriel Valley to um, find themselves yeah. and haven't returned. Um, so I was just wondering if those came up in your discussions. Yeah, that, that is definitely one area that I wish I had explored more in my book because um, most, almost all of the people that I interviewed um, identified as heterosexual and um, I do know some people that felt like the SGV was a very kind of um, heteronormative <laughs> space. Um, and I could certainly see you know, what you're talking about. But unfortunately, I was not able to explore that in my book. OK, we had a question over here just um, a second ago. Yeah. OK. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Alfred. And I was wondering if you've. Um, found a conclusion or um, formulated any solutions on how um, diverse people could come together and sort of how, how can we best like communicate with each other um, after studying um, the SGV? I, I know it's very <laughs> like, you know, maybe I'm asking for like an easy answer, but I, I just want to hear your thoughts. How can the SGV lead the way? Well, I, I think that um, something that has happened in the SGV that could be really positive is that because you have you know two or three generations um, that are growing up in relative stability in this area, there is an identity that's starting to come out of that place. You know, so Leslie mentioned the Chemexica flag, <laughs> and that's a T-shirt design um, by this brand called SGV that has been putting out um, SGV themed clothing and other paraphernalia. Um, and so I, you know, one of their designs is like the Sriracha bottle and, and but it says SGV on it. Um, another one they have is um, called SGV Dream Girl and it's this graphic of a young woman who's um, ambiguously Asian and Latina. Um, they have another one that is a, uh, um, a kind of hair cream that um, cholos like to use, <laughs> right? Um, and they have another one that's a, a picture of the plastic sandals that um, old Asian immigrant men like to wear, <laughs> right? So I think there's a way that, um, oh, and, and then um, one of my favorites, they recently came out with a hoodie and it's embossed with gold on the sleeve and it says, SGV, keeping it middle classy. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So I think there's something about claiming these kinds of spaces and being proud and having fun with those identities that does have a value for other people who are growing up in similar types of spaces to feel like they can assert themselves, express who they are, be, be comfortable where they are. Hi, I just want to say thank you so much for coming out and spending time with us and sharing this space. Um, I'm a big fan of your work with uh, Laura Pulido and uh, uh, People's Guide to LA, and I just wanted to ask if there were any other changing narratives of space that you came across, any particular stories that you'd like to share? Changing narratives of space. Well, I think this relates to the question that um, the woman from San Gabriel asked, you know, that it is a time where the identities of these places are really uh, up for grabs, you know, and that um, that claiming a space, you know. So um, there's another story in the book about um, a park that some of you may know. It's also in San Gabriel. It's um, it's Vincent Lugo Park, but it's a part of it called that that's sort of known by locals as Monster Park, <laughs> and it's this great 
playground for kids that has all these magical looking sea creatures um, that are sculpted out of concrete. Um, and you just go there and it looks like you've stumbled into a fantasy land. Um, and these sculptures were made by Benjamin Dominguez who was a Mexican immigrant. And recently, um, there, the city of San Gabriel is going to tear them down um, because they couldn't meet can, uh, modern safety codes. Um, but the community really rallied, and in particular, um, this multiracial group of San Gabriel residents that formed a nonprofit called Friends of La Laguna. And part of what they talked about was that um, part of the value of this space was that it was part of San Gabriel's immigrant and Chicano history. You know, so I think there are ways that um, claiming a place, you know, within these official identities is, is really important and it's something that is really up for grabs right now in this part of the SGV. I'm curious about the way in which identity is claimed. You were talking about, you know, SGV where, um, and I see a lot of the, like, the badges of SGV identity, you know, being claimed primarily by, by younger Asian Americans. Mm -hmm. So how are these badges being claimed? Are there any badges being claimed, you know, by, by Latinos? And are those as multiracial as the ones that you've seen being claimed by Asian Americans, if you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. I think so. <laughs> well, well, the, the Fung brothers kind of give the skew <laughs> to what's, uh, what is being claimed about the SGV, right? This sort of um, immigrant, um, ethnic Chinese immigrant um, food, <laughs> food culture. And even though they say they're working class, they don't really look working class, <laughs> right? Um, so I think uh, there are a lot of really great um, Latino writers that are coming out of the Eastern SGV. Michael Jaime Becerra, um, recently, he's published a beautiful collection of short stories. Um, Salvador Placencia wrote a uh, fantastic kind of magical realist novel about El Monte called People of Paper. Um, are, they, are they embracing the multiculturalism in the same way, that sort of shared okay. identity? That's what I'm trying to ask, yeah. Well, I think it's there, particularly in Michael Jaime Becerra's stories, and you know that you do have a multi-ethnic, multi-racial um, population in there, but this also gets to the question that the woman in the back asked about the Eastern SGV, that is, if you shift that point of analysis, then the dynamics change, right? So if you mm -hmm. go into the central SGV, if you go um, to places like La, Pla La Puente, what you're talking about is a more Latino dominant space, and then that changes it. And also, that part of the SGV has a really rich working class Mexican history that's its own thing. And you a know? different kind of identity altogether. Yeah. So it's, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, okay, all right, I'm just curious. Um, and, yes. Hi, uh, my name is Jenny. Um, I wanted to ask, I know you sort of touched on this before, but about the relationship between um, American-born Chinese and Mexican-Americans and the more recent immigrants, especially like in the school systems, is there sort of tensions between it? Is it very generative? Is, um, and also maybe how these sort of transnational movements disturb this notion of place and, and um, create sort of different uh, definitions of it? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I think that's, that's a great question and again, something that I would like someone else to research and tell me more about, you know, because I think a lot of the dynamics that I captured were really from, you know, people who were um, not so trans-Pacific as um, a lot of young Asians are now right, um, that they were coming here and they, they were just here, <laughs> right, and they were gonna figure out how to make, make their lives in the place that they were. Um, so, yeah, I definitely think that that's, um, that's a piece that would be another great project to do. <laughs> Maybe you can do it. Okay. <laughs> Elaine? Yes. Okay. Hi, um, my name is Bob. Um, I was wondering that after you saw that the initial uh, landing into Monterey Park, Alhambra, that some of the uh, Chinese groups actually then migrated into different sections to be together as one, such as the Chinese move, uh, mainland Chinese move to one location, Taiwanese to another, British Hong Kong residents to a third area in the San Gabriel Valley. Are you asking, did they do that? Um, no, not in such a distinct way. I mean, I think. Some, something else that's really interesting about the SGV is the heterogeneity of Chineseness in the SGV. You know, so I think I saw um, somewhere that the number of countries that ethnic Chinese come from who live in the SGV is in the dozens. 
you know. Um, so I don't think, you know, I, I think part of it is that people are aware that there are a lot of different kinds of experiences, um, and I don't think they, um, well, you know, uh, some of those communities, like the Taiwanese, are very uh, might be very politically identified, um, but I don't think that 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 they separated themselves spatially in those ways. Yeah, I remember some comments. Um, I saw to not this Fung Brothers video, but a different one, the the six two six video, um, that you know you had people saying, well, you know, this this represents like a segment of the population in the six two six, but they were not only saying that you know this. We have Latinos here too, but also different Asian groups that are also underrepresented, but are definitely there, like Vietnamese. That you know, yeah, I know you talk to in the book, but it's just not something that usually pops up as a group associated with the SGV that's also there. Right. right. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Um, anybody else? We all done? Yeah, I think we're all done. Okay. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us and thank you for all your questions. They were really wonderful and I hope that you had a good time and learned a great deal about the San Gabriel Valley. I know I did. So thanks for coming out. <laughs>